When it comes to four wheel drive mods, everyone including myself seems to go straight to your suspension, tyres and power mods when modifying their vehicle for off-road use. But there's another mod that gives you the best dollar to performance for going further off-road and it's called a locker. And today we're going to be putting one in the 80 and then going away on a trip to discover the true difference it makes. So what brand locker did I buy and how can a non-mechanic like me install this at home? Well, we're going to find all that out, but firstly, why would you actually want a locker? So most four-wheel drives have what's called a limited slip differential or LSD in the rear of the vehicle. As you can see here on my 80 series, it still allows the wheels to turn at different speeds, but the limited slip differential applies a mechanical resistance allowing both wheels to spin together in situations where you need more traction. Now on the front diff, most four-wheel drives on the road will still have their factory open diff, which is great and allows the wheels to spin independently and at different speeds, which is awesome for going around tight corners, but it can become an issue when you go off-road and you're lifting wheels, as the driveline wants to send the power to the wheel with the least amount of resistance. So if one wheel is off the ground, another one is planted, all the power will get sent to the one with the least amount of resistance, which will be the one spinning in the air, and that means your car essentially goes back into two-wheel drive as that wheel will not spin. So how do we solve this? Well, you can buy this thing called a locker, which essentially locks those two wheels together so they are forced to turn at the same time. Meaning even when one wheel is off the ground, the other will keep you rolling up the track. Now, there are a few different types of lockers you can get. You can get an auto locker, an e-locker, air locker, and then you have, you know, jamming an arc rod through the fill plug, which obviously I don't want to do because I need this to be uh, an unlockable and disengageable item. Now, I didn't want an auto locker because I don't want it to affect the daily driving of this car, especially the fact that the 80 is a full-time four-wheel drive. I also didn't want an e-locker due to some of the reliability issues I've heard both online and in person, and I already had installed an onboard air system in preparation for a future air locker, so my real decision was between the ARB and TJM air lockers. Now, you can read so many posts about these two lockers from the seal issues on the ARB to the strength of the TJM. I spent so much time going back and forth, but the general consensus was that TJM had the more favorable design, as unlike the ARB air locker, the TJM Pro lockers aren't reliant off the rotational seals that the ARB uses, but on the other hand, the ARB lockers are arguably stronger and are used more frequently in high shock load applications such as winch challenges. So as you can see, it was almost a coin flip for me between the two, but after considering what I'm doing with the car, I've picked out the TJM Pro Locker. So now a little bit of history on these. These were originally the creation of local Melbourne disc specialist, Jack McManara, who made the McManara diff lock. Now these had a great reputation and many argue to this day, they were the best diff lock money could buy. But eventually the design of that diff lock ended up being sold to TJM and in turn came the curation of the TGM Pro Locker. And that's what I've got right here in front of me. And now the reason for going a front locker and not a rear locker was it mostly for reliability reasons. Say for instance the locker stops working, being that the front is already an open diff, I'm not losing anything if the locker won't engage out in the bush. But if I'd replaced my rear LSD with a rear locker and it failed out in the bush, well, I could be stuck down the bottom of the track and I'd only have an open diff in the rear. So I figured as is my first locker and since I'm installing it myself, a front locker would be the better choice. All right, so the 80 series is in the shed, ready to start tearing it down to get our new front locker in now. It seems like a daunting task putting in an air locker. I am slightly concerned by it, but we're gonna give it a crack because I'll never get it done without just giving it a shot. So let's just give it a shot. What I gotta do first is pull apart the front end. Now I've done that before, so I'm pretty confident we can get those CVs out fairly quickly because you must have the CVs out before we can pull that front center diff out. So let's go ahead, do that, and then we can really get started on putting this locker together. Oh, rationing ring spares. Oh my God, these are amazing. How have I lived so long without you? Now, it's this extra labor that makes getting a diff installed that much more expensive, but it is fairly straightforward and it's definitely something you can do in your shed at home. All right, so both CVs are out now. It took me about an hour, a little over an hour, which isn't too bad considering I'm still learning a lot of things. So they're all out. Really good to see that there's plenty of molly grease still left in the actual swivel hub itself. So we know that that uh, interaction seal has been working, it was pushed in correctly and we've got no oil leaking through, through which is awesome. Um, so our next step now is to tackle the diff itself. So we're gonna be taking off the front tail shaft and then um, pulling off the back face of the diff and uh, out with that will come the center. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead, get to that.
All right, so the center is now out of the 80. It's on the table, and we're sort of just having a look at it because me, Liam and I have never actually pulled apart a diff before, so this is our first sort of experience with it. So what we're actually doing is measuring the factory backlash and the factory gear meshing. Now, obviously, as the gears wear down, the backlash will change, but we just wanted to get a, a reading um, of what it's sort of doing now at this stage. When we put it all back together, we can compare them and sort of see how it's sitting. Now, we're not changing out um, the pinion seal, which, because mine's not leaking, so I'm not doing it. Um, and you don't have to change it out to actually replace the locker. So we're purely just taking out the old center, taking off the old crown wheel and putting the old crown wheel onto our new pro locker center there. So what we've just done, we've used this um, Persian blue, it's a, basically it's a non-drying like gear mesh compound that you can use to mark on the crown wheel gears. So you mark it on there and then you run it through along the pinion gear and it'll basically show how they're meshing and how they're connecting. So you should get a pattern where it's all sort of showing that they're connecting in the center of the gear. You don't want them leaning off to you know the toe of the heel because if that starts to happen, you can wear out the gear and you can break teeth off. So it's very important, as much as the backlash everyone talks about, is actually getting the gear mesh right. So we took our measurements here, we know our figures, so now when we pull it all apart and put it back together, we can compare that with our factory settings and um, yeah, get this thing within spec and get it so we're gonna have no issues in the future. All right, so we are following a little bit of a manual here from TJM, it comes with a kit. It's not like super in depth or anything, but it just kind of gives you, puts your points in the right direction and shows you the right specs and stuff. So Liam's got a center punch there. We're gonna punch uh, the bearing caps because they, do, they are machined for a particular side of the differential. So we'll punch them so we don't actually mix them up and then we can get those bearing caps out, off, get the center out and get that old crown wheel off and onto our new pro locker. So let's do it. There comes the center. All right, sweet. So obviously now we've got the center out and this is our old ring gear, which you reuse when you put in the pro locker. So we'll smash all these bolts out, uh, take off the old gear and throw the old gear onto our new locker. All right, there is our ring gear. Should've just welded that together. <laughs> all right, so we've got our new center out of its box, as you can see, looks a little different to our old one there. Um, we're still yet to push on our carry bearing, which we will do in a sec, but first, Liam just cleaned up the ring gear. That'll be getting dropped on. Um, hopefully it fits straight away, otherwise we might need to throw it in the oven just to get it expand a bit more to get it over it. Um, and then yeah, we can get it on and get this thing assembled. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, straight on. That's a good trick, eh? That worked bloody amazing. We then made sure to use some thread locker to attach our ring gear to our new center. All right, all right, so now we'll talk them all down. So first we tried to talk these up on the bench, but as you can see, it requires a fair bit of force to get these to spec. So it's really handy to have a good vise with some aluminum plates so you can hold it in there securely and get it tightened up correctly. Once the ring gear was properly attached to the new center, we could then press on our new carrier bearings. Because we don't have a shop press, we used a hydraulic jack under the workbench along with some cut tube and a bearing race drive to press on the new bearings. Luckily, Dad built this workbench really strong, so this method worked a treat. Make sure. Yep. The grease loves it. <laughs> yeah, she's coming down. All right, so I've got the carry bearings pressed on our new diff center and it's time for the scary part. It's time to drill a hole through our um, diff center housing. So um, Liam went ahead and found a tap. So we got the right tap. Quarter inch BSB. Yep. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, pretty much just, just think it through. Just measure twice, cut once sort of thing. We've sort of found an accurate location. We actually did a dry fit just to see how it all lines up. Um, and now that we're happy with it, um, we're gonna put a hole in it. So let's get doing, it, doing that. <laughs> So with the holes drilled, it's time now to put the locker back in the car. So Liam's just going to uh, pre-grease where the uh, our races are going to sit. So we just use some gear oil for that. So lubricate that, and then we can go ahead, get the pro locker, drop it in, and then we'll get on to starting to do the um, tighten up of the carry bearings and all that. So. 
Now, in order to tighten up our carry bearings, we need to create our own tool that could attach to the carry bearing adjuster nut and allow us to properly tighten these carry bearings. All right, so we've tied up the carry bearings and now it's time to actually set our backlash on the actual gears themselves because the backlash is essentially how much this gear moves without turning the actual tail shaft essentially. So to set your backlash, you're essentially tightening these carry bearings back and forth to get the backlash correct. So we've got the magnetic base here, we've got the little dial gauge up here and then we're gonna be just using a G clamp here on uh, the pinion and that will stop that from moving so we can then measure the backlash correctly which is pretty much what we had before. Now the question is, do we want to tighten that backlash up? Because this little machine Liam's using here essentially has a little, it's like a little pin end at the, at the end of it essentially, and it'll measure tiny little increments of distance. So the spec we've got to get to in this backlash, um, for example, is 0.15 to 0.20 millimeters. So you need this tool to be able to measure those bit, very fine. Bit tighter there. Yeah, so we're up to 20. Okay. Well, do we tighten up a little bit more, measure the backlash, and then we'll put some gear paint on and, and yeah. see how our mesh is, essentially. All right, so now that we've got that backlash within spec, we're gonna go ahead and actually put some gear marking compound on the teeth themselves, because you wanna make sure that the ring gear and the pinion gear are correctly meshing, because if they're not, um, you know, could be 10,000 Ks later, you could break a tooth off. So it's really important that they're meshing in the right spot in the center of each tooth. So we've got some gear marking compound, um, we're gonna put that on the teeth, and then we'll be able to see um, how well they've been they're meshed together. So let's find out. And then with a rag around the pinion gear to simulate some load on the gears, we span it around to get our markings. Because yeah, our pattern is, is way down here. We need to get it further up here, right? So if we loosen that end off, right? And then tighten this end more, and that would maybe straighten us up a bit. Oh yeah, well look at that. All right, so I've probably spent the last two hours uh, working on our gear mesh and backlash. Just Trying to get it looking bright because essentially you really want these gears to mesh correctly otherwise you know you'd be driving around never knowing if they're quite hit right or not so we spent the time we got them to where we're pretty happy with them and I'd, i'm happy with them like the what was it the drive was it near it was maybe a little bit a little bit on the toe side of things but like mm. for a crown wheel that's done 400 plus thousand k's and not being able to adjust the pinion because you know it's already all together we haven't been able to adjust that just got off the backlash we got it to where we were happy with it and i think honestly they look pretty good so we're talking up the bearing caps now to 70 foot pound I think we've got that one. And then we'll get the actuator back on top, we'll get the faces cleaned up, and get this back in the 80. And after attaching the actuator, we fired some air through to make sure it was working. We then locked in the carry bearings using the locking tab, we torqued them to spec, we could then cut our copper tube to length and slide our fitting over the top. We also used a sealant to ensure no oil or water could get past the fitting. Once all the fittings were tight, we attached a hose to do a final air leak test and test for proper engagement of the locker before we put it all back in the car. Yep. Yep. We also did one last final check of the backlash just in case anything had not moved. All right, so the diff is all ready. It's all back together. The airlines are fitted, we've tested it, it works. So all we gotta do now, get it back in the car. We're actually gonna be using um, an RTV sealant instead of a gasket. One, because I just didn't get a genuine hoodie gasket in time, but I've also heard that these RTV sealants are a lot better than a paper gasket. So we're using um, RTV Ultra Grey um, from Permatex. So yeah, we'll throw some of this on and um, clean all the surfaces and hopefully um, she'll never leak. But yeah, let's get to it. We took this opportunity to give inside of the diff housing one last good clean, and then we could put the differential back in the car. Oh, there we go. And just like that, the 80 now had a front locker. All right, so last night we got the air locker installed. It's in the 80 there. So what we gotta do now is rebuild this front end. And then once that's all done, we can run our airlines back to our tank. So let's get onto this. Let's get this locker done. So with the shed becoming a mess, I lowered the 80 back down and got stuck into rebuilding that front end. Now you probably remember the time consuming part of this is the cleaning. Pulling off all those gaskets, cleaning all the services, and putting it all back together makes pulling out a diff center a lot of work. But since this was now my third time pulling apart the front end, I'm getting pretty efficient at it and was able to get it all back together in a couple of hours. Then don't forget to fill your diff with oil. I'm using 85140 as the TGM manual specified, but I've heard using oil like 80W90 is fine as well. 
All right, so now the car's back together. It's got diff oil on it. It's all ready to go. So all we gotta do now is wire up our actual airline to our locker. So in the kit, it comes with an actuator. So that's gonna obviously um, allow air to travel through when you hit your locker switch. So you gotta wire in the locker switch, wire in the actuator, and run our air hose all the way back to our air tank and compressor. So we'll get doing that. And uh, yeah, hopefully the things will be done pretty soon. So let's get on to it. Running the airline is a pretty straightforward job. Make sure you pick a route which isn't going to interfere with anything too hot or things are going to move. I chose to run mine tight against the chassis rail and then up through the body near the passenger seats to then go to my compressor, which is located in the rear of the vehicle. I attached the actuator to the manifold off my tank and then ran the wires to a switch in my center console. All right, this is sort of the moment of truth. The airline's been run, the power's been run, the switch is there. All we gotta do now, turn on the compressor and hit the switch and try and spin the front wheel. So as we can see right now, open front diff, one spinning and one is not. Now by rights, we hit the switch and they both spin at the same time. Flick the switch. Oh, they're working. It's locked the front diff. Oh my god, I'm that happy. Look at it go. One spin both. Now, we'll hit the switch again. Hit the switch. Heard it, the breather come out there. And now these should unlock. Ha 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 ha! Oh, you guys don't know how happy I am. Like, I've been doing this like three days now, and I know it should probably only take four or five hours to install a diff locker, but being our first time, we just took it slow and it was just a learning process in itself learning about differentials gear mesh I'm so keen to now take this out so let's go out to the bush let's actually try this thing and see what difference it makes to this car all right we've come out to the Avon area we're gonna hopefully do some wheeling give this front lock a bit of a workout and just do some camping while we're here. So, the sky's looking nice, good weather. I'm in a t shirt and we're in August. So, all's looking good. So, let's get into it. Today, we're in the Avon region in the Victorian high country. And I'm here with some mates to do some wheeling and camping. But I'm also going to be testing out the front locker for the first time and showing you guys the huge difference it makes off road. Now, for someone who's never had a locker before, um, I'll tell you this this is how the front locker feels. When you switch it on, it's like driving with no power steering. It's very hard to turn the front wheels, obviously, because they're both locked and turning at the same time. So if you're trying to turn, it's it's hard. It's doable, but it's just hard. So primarily, I've been using it mainly on straight bits. So a straight, steep descent with a lot of wombat holes, I'll flick it on. And then when I get up to the top and I'm ready to turn the corner, I'll flick it back off. Um, and that's how I've been using it. So here is a great demonstration of the difference a locker makes. So this is me driving up the hill, unlocked, and watch what happens when the right wheel loses traction. You'll see that the left hand wheel won't turn because all the torque is being sent to the wheel with the least amount of resistance. But watch what happens when we engage our front locker. The car simply walks up as if it wasn't even an obstacle to begin with. I guess one of the biggest things I've noticed with having the locker on this trip is the confidence it's given me. Like, being able to tackle hard stuff that before you'd have to be very careful to pick the right line, to give it just the, amount of, the right amount of mumbo to get over stuff. Whereas having the locker, you flick it on and you can literally crawl over things you never could before. Even if you pick a wrong line, as long as the locker's on, you might have one wheel in the air, but there's a good chance you'll still make it up over it. So it just gives you that huge confidence boost to tackle that harder stuff and do it more safely, more elegantly, um, and ultimately get to the top a lot easier. So I really hope this video helped you guys out or gave you the confidence to install a locker yourself. So if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, get subscribed, and let me know in the comments. Are you interested in getting a locker now? Have you already got one in your four-wheel drive? Let me know, and we'll see you in the next one.